five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. And with that, welcome to your Media Mosh Podcast. I am your host, Shane Beauregard, coming at you with all your news, reviews, and previews. I want to watch on your streamer services, your television, and your local theater. I hope everyone's had a great weekend. Coming at you with finally back-to-back weeks, folks, and just a couple notes on that. Uh, there's going to be some weeks where I just don't prepare any notes and just go into it the best I can because I started school back this semester uh, which has uh, been nervous, and I've been nervous, and it's been uh, excited at the same time. I guess that's the way I can say it. I haven't opened a book in about 15 years, and seeing that it's a summer class, everything is condensed, which just hit me last week. So when I'm not in between clients and doing the things I need to do, I am studying and doing what I need to do for school. I feel like Rodney Dangerfield and back to school. That's what I feel like. So that's the big news for me. So when I get time, obviously I'll prepare the best I can because I at least want to produce the best amateur podcast <laughs> that you guys can listen to. But if I don't, I'm going to get something out regardless. That's where I'm at right now. But the summer is finally, uh, the unofficial start, the summer is finally upon us. Uh, kids are out of school. Everything's going great. They're busy. I am super busy. So we're just going to get rolling into this episode. I don't have a ton of news for everybody. Uh, Jupiter's Legacy, as I just talked about it last week, I was going to review it this week, but Netflix cut my legs out from underneath me because they canceled season two, which is a shock to me because I will say this about it. It was an uneven series at best. Maybe that's what happens when you have Josh Dumel as your lead. No offense, <laughs> but um, it was broken up into like two different kind of segments that show. They did the origin story between the original superheroes and present day what's going on with the kids and the younger generation. The older origin stuff is the things that worked for me in that show. The kids just annoyed me. They were bratty. That part just did not work for me. But I thought they would at least flesh it out for season two, seeing how they dumped $200 million into that show. Now, apparently, they're going to have a spinoff based on the villains in that same universe. I don't know how that's going to work. If you're going that route, then just fix season two and put them in season two why go that route uh so i don't know so no need for me to review that and no need to watch that season if you haven't seen it unless you want to prepare for the whole villains season or show that's going to be coming out so you can familiarize yourself with what's going on in that universe otherwise stay away on the other hand shadow and bones which i just finished i'm not going to review that one but that one was just renewed for season two and the much awaited loki is out as we speak at least i think it is because I, I think that was originally supposed to come out on the 11th for a Friday morning show, but they changed it to Wednesday, and I haven't double-checked. So it may be out now, or it may, may be coming out on Friday. I don't know. Regardless, I'm going to watch it this week when I get time. Uh, other than that, I've been watching Ragnarok. I told you that Swedish, weird Swedish version of Thor uh, Season 2. I'm slow playing that one, so I'm on Episode 2. It's not the greatest. It's cheesy. It's campy, but I kind of dig it, so that's where I'm at there. Uh, so that's all I'm kind of, kind of getting really into for the news this week. Uh, next week at the theater, you have the Hitman Wife's Bodyguard. I think is coming out on the 11th. I'm gonna go check that one out. So uh, right now on Netflix, there's not a whole lot out. They came out with the Netflix original Awake, uh, the Netflix original movie Extreme, which that's hardcore action. So I'll probably check that one out. And then you have the kids movie, Kids Wish, or you have the kids show out, Wish Dragon. And then you have the kids show, Wish Dragon, comes out this weekend. And that's really it, folks, for the Netflix side of things. So let's get right into what's the top 10 streaming shows and movies on Netflix right now. Number 10, the Netflix original, Bo, Bo Burnham, tongue twister, Bo Burnham, Inside. Number 9, the Pixar film, not Pixar, DreamWorks film, Monsters and Aliens. Number eight, the Netflix movie Extreme. Number seven, the Netflix movie Dog Gone Trouble. Number six, DreamWorks Home. Number five, Coco Melon, still in the top five. Number four, Dirty John Season 2 with Christian Slater and Amanda Peet, who I have not seen in forever. I had a big crush on her back in the whole nine yards kind of day. Uh, and, oh, and I think she was in She's the One. That's where I got the crush on her from. Anyway, moving on. Number three, the Netflix original movie Two Hearts. Number two, the Netflix original show 
Lucifer in number one, the Netflix original show Sweet Tooth. That is your top ten shows and movies streaming on Netflix as we speak. Now let's turn our attention to the box office real quick as we are finally getting back to the theater, which is very exciting. Number five, Raya and the Last Dragon bringing in $1.3 million. And a side note on that, if you have Disney Plus, you no longer have to pay the 30 bucks to see it. It's on there if you have Disney Plus, so go check it out. Number four, Spirit Untamed, based on the Netflix original show. Uh, my kids love that show, bringing in $6.1 million. Number three, Disney's Cruella bringing in $11 million. Number two, A Quiet Place 2 drops down from number one to number two, bringing in 19.3. And number one, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, bringing in $24.1 million. Now, a couple quick thoughts on A Quiet Place, because I didn't grade it, and I'm not going to really review it. I'm just going to talk about a couple parts. Um, Again, I told you it was a very solid sequel. It was a nice entrance back into the movie theaters after a long break i thought it was a very seamless transition by throwing cillian murphy in there for john krasinski uh i like john krasinski i think more as a director than a writer like i love the story behind the first quiet place second quiet place i mean it was okay it was your basic story again it starts off right where one ends up or leaves off i should say emily blunt takes her family she tries to find refuge. That's where she comes across Cillian Murphy's character, who doesn't really want to help them out because there's no one really left. There's no one worth saving, as far as he knows. But he puts them up for a day or two, knowing that she has that newborn baby. And they do a good job keeping the baby quiet, because I was like, okay, whatever. But they do, they, they do cover that subject very well. Uh, Emily Blunt's oldest daughter uh, kind of deciphers this uh, radio transmission and... She finds she deciphers this radio transmission, and she sets up upon her own little mission to find this island where the song is uh, originating from, because she believes that's a place of refuge and there's other people there. So she she departs from the main group, goes on her way. Emily Blunt convinces Cillian Murphy to go after her. So you got two different groups here. You got Emily Blunt and the rest of her kids, which the oldest son is annoying. No offense, I would have threw him out of my. <laughs> I would have threw him out of my vault that you're in and just let him get taken care of. He was so whiny. Oh, and he kind of redeemed himself at the end, but not enough for me. I would have just like I would have sacrificed him. So the, the best part of the movie for me was the Cillian Murphy in the eldest daughter's journey to try to find these uh, where the signal is coming from. So that's all I'll say. The only nitpick and I, uh, thing I have with John Krasinski's, uh, the way he directs, is sometimes... Like, say if you're in a room and there's, like, um, a headset on a table, he'll zoom into that headset and leave that sh- stay on that shot for, like, a couple seconds. And then in the next room there'll be a gun and he'll zoom in on that. C- kind of foreshadowing, like, pay attention to these pieces around the room because they're going to come into play uh, in the movie. So, I, you know, to me, if you're not smart enough to kind of pick that up on your own, I don't like to be told that sort of thing. So to me, other than that, again, in this movie, he's a better director than a writer. Um, I like John Krasinski. So uh, my grade for Quiet Place 2 is a 4 out of 5. Again, very solid sequel. Now let's move on to movies I wanted to discuss last week, or one last week and I didn't fit it in, and one I saw in the theater this week. The first one is Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. Now this guy, who I will defend Zack Snyder on certain points, and there are certain points where I just cannot defend this guy. But what for whatever reason, man, he has a just a very feverish fan base these days. Ever since that whole Snyder Justice League cut, it seems like he has this whole Zack Snyder army behind him because they want like ten Army of the Dead's. They want the snack, yeah, snack Zack Snyder universe back. It's ridiculous. This one sits at sixty eight percent critic score with a seventy five percent audience score on Rotten Tomato. It has an extremely long runtime of two hours and twenty eight minutes. Now, one negative off the bat, this movie could have been done in an hour and a half. It did not need to be two hours. Batista headlines this cast, and you'd recognize some of them. Some of them I didn't recognize. Garrett Dillahunt is in this movie. He's usually a douchebag in a lot of movies. Tig Notaro, who replaced uh, Chris Dielli. Oh, shit, I know I'm butchering his last name. Um, but anyway, she replaced him in this movie, so they had to go and do a bunch of reshoots. Uh, Horaka Sanada who was actually Scorpion in the latest Mortal Kombat movie, and Theo Rossi, who was in Sons of Anarchy in one of the Punisher seasons. 
Uh, the rest of the cast I'm not going to go over. So you know the gist of this movie. They get sent in to uh, steal a bunch of money from a vault in Las Vegas. And they have to make their way through a bunch of zombies. So I'm not going to review what goes on there. Now I'll, I'll give Zack Snyder credit for this. Now I'm going to explain this movie like you've seen this movie before. Now, like Zack Snyder knows how to shoot action scenes. A lot of it was fine. But there was just too much packed in here. Here's what I didn't like about the movie. So uh, you have Batista. Now this is part heist, part zombie, part father-daughter movie. It's like three genres mashed into one. Because along the way you find out Batista has a daughter who's trying to help these refugees get to a better place. Now the government's set on blowing Las Vegas up. So they're on a timetable to try to get into this vault to get the money for Tanaka and get out of there. So, uh, along the way, Batista's daughter saves, uh, or tries to save this girl, Gita, who's trapped inside Las Vegas. The zombies took her, so she's kind of her own mission. Batista's reluctant into letting her come with, but he ends up deciding to. So she's tagged along with this crew uh, that Batista put together to get this money. Now, that's all said and good. Now, Tanaka brings his own man in there, played by Dylan Hunt, and he's, no one trusts him because he's, he is shady. He's one of the shadiest characters in this movie. You get, uh, what do you get? You get uh, pregnant zombies, which I don't want to go into. You get robot zombies. You get a tiger zombie. So he goes all out in this, in this movie. Here's what I didn't like about this movie. There's one scene in this movie as they're navigating their way through one building where they have, they have different... I almost said genres, but different types of zombies. So there's one kind of, and I forgot what they're called, like scavengers or scathers or something, where they're kind of frozen in place, but if you touch them, they come back alive and then you're done. So there's one scene where uh, Dylan Hunt makes her one of the squad members are makes a trap for her knowing that she's going to die. Now, somehow she fights her way through 50 of these things, Ends up bursting through the window, still fighting him off, so she's still alive and hasn't been bitten yet. And the rest of the squad just kind of stares at her for five minutes. What the fuck? Like, there's eight people there, armed to the gills. Help her out. One person fires a shot, and they give up on her. Done. That's one problem I have with this movie. Uh, I covered the zombie pregnancy. Now, <laughs> again, this is way into spoilers, but there's a safe cracker on the team. Why is he there? Please someone explain this to me. Why is he there? Because if it's Tanaka's safe, they're going in. Shouldn't he have the code to the safe? Why do they need this guy? Which he did provide some comic relief. I did like his character. But when I sat on it and I thought about it, unnecessary character, maybe just used for comic relief. They didn't need the goddamn uh, code if, Tana if it's Tanaka's safe. Uh, at the end, well, at the end, Gita, the girl that uh, Batista's daughter is looking for, they get on a plane at the very end of the movie. It crashes. We don't see we don't see her ever again. So we see her board the helicopter. What happened to her? We don't know. One thing I read is that uh, along the editing process, when they had to edit Tig into the movie, it, she got lost in some of those scenes. But they should have somehow explained it. The other part that pissed me off at the very end of this movie, Dieter, the safe cracker, and um, my favorite character, Vander E, are kind of one-on-one -on -one with the king of the zombies called Zeus. He's the originating zombie that escaped at the beginning of the movie. He's the big alpha. So anyway, anyone he bites, he transforms into these fast-moving thinking zombies. So they have a square off with him. Dieter sacrifices himself, locks Vandy into the vault, and we don't see him till the end of the movie. Very end of the movie, they blow Las Vegas up. He pops out of the safe. Here we go. Spoiler extra spoilers he gets on a plane because he has his money with him and he ends up uh we see he gets bitten and he's going to turn into a zombie which i call bullshit because he actually fought the scene where he fights zeus not once did he get bit before he got thrown into that safe so bullshit i'm calling bullshit and that pisses me off if it doesn't i don't like shit that happens off screen because we saw the whole goddamn action scene between him and zeus and that one time the zeus bite him but yet he got bit somehow off screen that pissed me off and honestly, the thing that bothered me the most, the whole heist part of this movie was a MacGuffin. The heist was not needed. It was a cover-up because Tanaka, all Tanaka wanted was the head of Zeus, we'll call it Zeus's wife, the queen zombie. 
he wanted the head of this zombie because it's worth like 200 million dollars so they can use extract some of the dna or something out of the zombies to use for medical purposes or to form their own army whatever the case may be so he set this whole heist thing up as a MacGuffin to grab the head which Dylan Hunt tried to do why not hire this group to go in there and take the head that's all they had to do they saw the queen the first like as soon as they entered the city the queen was right there they could have got it done in 10 minutes why do we need to go through two hours and 20 minutes of exposition to find out the whole heist was bullshit Ugh. that was my big issues and it sounds like a lot of them because it is I'll never see this movie again it's not worth a rewatch if it was an hour and a half I may throw it in but can't do it so I I like Batista in this movie I'm liking him more and more the more I see him in movies I can't really name a bad movie he's been in I really like it so I'm going to disagree with the critics and the audience I'm going to give Army of the Dead a 2 out of 5 and let's hope and pray there's not 5 more of these sequels because I don't care about zombie babies or why there are zombie robots I just don't give a shit. So let's just move on uh, from this movie. But I'm sure Zack Snyder's fans will come out of the fucking woodwork. And Netflix will probably throw another $250 million at them. And we'll get a part two. Alright, so me and the VP finally made it back to the theater together. <laughs> for the first time like in a year and a half. And we went and saw Wrath of Man. Directed and written by Guy Ritchie. Now there are two other writing credits on this movie. I didn't jot them down. <laughs> um... This movie, of course, stars Jason Statham, Holt McCallaney. Uh, we see Josh Hartnett, which we haven't seen in a while. You get Jeffrey Donovan, who I haven't seen in a while. Andy Garcia is in here for a couple scenes. And you have the not-so-very-talented Scott Eastwood in this movie. And I'll just read the plot. The plot follows H, played by Jason Statham, a cold and mysterious character working at a cash truck company responsible for moving hundreds of millions of dollars around Los Angeles each week. So I, this is probably the more one of the more straightforward Guy Ritchie movies he's directed. Uh, stylistically, I mean, this film felt like it was like late 70s, early 80s in the way it was shot. Yeah, you had some nice action scenes in here. But I'm just talking about there's no quirky, speed them up, slowing down, freeze frame action films uh, that Guy Ritchie's kind of known for. And this is straightforward. Now, you do have to kind of pay attention because this is one of the movies that kind of jumps around. Like, it starts out present day, then it goes three months forward, three weeks back, five months forward, four months back. Uh, and it tells three different stories in the one you get. And this is spoiler free. So, you get some, You get this crew that are knocking off these armored trucks to get this the money. The opening scene, there's a uh, botched attempt where someone gets killed where they weren't supposed to get killed. And this is where Jason Statham enters the picture. He's looking for revenge. So he kind of goes undercover working for this armored car company. That's his storyline. He's trying to find out if it's an inside job. He's trying to find out if anyone knows anything, if anyone knows his crew. So he's kind of on his own mission. What I like about Jason Statham in this movie, it's a different Jason Statham. There's no joking around. There's no dark humor jokes in here. He plays a straightforward, I don't give a shit about anybody, badass. Okay, so... You get that part, then you get his background, where he actually came from, and what he's connected to. Uh, then you get what happens and why he's on this mission. Then you get the actual crew part, and I'm not going to name names there. Uh, and you get the whole, their whole backstory, which again, this movie runs two out. This movie runs two hours, and honestly, it was a little bit long. It it was draggy because again, it takes parts in different like. It throws like three different chapters at you. In fact, the movie's told in like, I think, four chapters. And each chapter kind of has a name. Um, and then it ties it all together at the very end. But, again, I liked just the plain, simple, straightforward direction by Guy Ritchie. He's on a little bit of a roll with this one coming off of The Gentleman. And I, I've always been a Guy Ritchie fan. And he did have a slump years ago where he made just two or three like really bad movies. But I do feel like he's on the uptick. And paired with Jason Statham, you can't go wrong. But just don't expect like the typical Jason Statham high kick, front punch kind of roundhouse movies. This is not. <laughs> this is not one of those movies. And actually it was kind of good to see Josh Hartnett on screen. I mean he's in there for several scenes. But I just haven't seen him in a, I have not seen him in a while. And sorry, Scott Eastwood, you just can't act. He can't act. He just—if he didn't have the last name Eastwood, I don't think he'd be an actor. He's just 
I think John Cena is a better actor than Scott Eastwood. There, I said it. I said it. He's terrible. And I think that's the reason why he's not in Fast and Furious 9. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and this one is sitting at 66% critic score with a 91% audience score. Um, it does have some flaws because, the, the, I mean, the plot's very basic. But you don't see a revenge movie or a heist movie because of the plot. Maybe the heist movie you do, but a revenge movie you do not. Uh, but I had no problem with this movie. I loved it. I'll probably end up watching it again. Not in the theater, but I will watch it again at some point when it comes on cable TV or one of the streaming services. I'll definitely watch it again. So I'm going to go higher than the critics, but not as high as the audience because it did have some issues. I'm going to give Wrath of Man a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Good on Guy Ritchie. Good on Jason Statham. Uh, best action guy going today. There I said it. And that's it, folks. That's all I have for you. Uh, next week, I still have a laundry list I need to get to, uh, so bear with me, and hopefully I'll have notes to prepare for that show. Before I let you go, check out uh, On the QT with John Amenta and Lloyd Green. It's a, new Quentin Tarant- it's a new Quentin Tarantino podcast, so if you have it, they're on episode two right now. Go check out the intro and episode one, wherever you find your podcast now. Uh, episode one was Rever- Reservoir Dogs. Episode 2 is Pulp Fiction. You have a different guest every week breaking down Tarantino movies. And what can be more entertaining than that? Not much, folks. So, again, it's on the QT. Go download that wherever your podcasts are are available. In the meantime, go to my Facebook Media Mosh page. Go to the Apple Podcast Store. Download me. Share me with your friends. They'll appreciate you letting me into their lives. And then circle the wagons and go check out Mr. Argue Myself, Chris Rodell, on the Instagram, Facebooks, and the Twitterverse. Three different platforms for three different types of content. Oh, before I before I sign off, I would like to admit a mistake I made last week on my first podcast back. I got <laughs> Patty Jenkins' filmography mixed up with Catherine Bigelow, which is a big no-no. I, I shouldn't have done that, but I wasn't in the right frame of mind. For some reason, I had Catherine Bigelow's movies under Patty Jenkins' <laughs> filmography, and they're not even close. Catherine Bigelow is the better director. So that's it, folks. I just wanted to admit that so you don't think I'm crazy and you're coming at me. Until then, get caught up. Get caught up in the mosh.